down here. He oh, was in right. Spot Coffee. Oh, and right. I went up to him and talked to him. I had like a five minute conversation <laughs> with him. And he said he would come down. Sure. I think it's Samuel Jackson. Yeah. Yeah. Samuel, it's his choice great. for naming it, but I think it's not yet uh, finally named unless I've missed something. Ooh. It's rather That's divisive, though, proposal. right? <laughs> we like it better that way. <laughs> I, I it's called education. I just wanted to say with the Nuremberg principles, of course, even though the. the, the the military says, oh, yes, you know, change of command and all of that. Or even, you know, like in schools for reporting child abuse, they say, you know, report it to your supervisor or something, chain of command. But in the Nuremberg principles, there was nothing about chain of command. And while we're, the, 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 the standard that we hold that the United States and the Allied forces held the, the, the axis, you know, the, the Nazis too, was absolutely, there's nothing about chain of command. You do everything in your power as a civilian or as a military person or as a judge or anybody else to stop the illegal acts of your government. You are absolutely fully responsible to do that, and we all are. And so was Bradley Manning, and that is exactly what he did. It's just heartbreaking that they're, they're, they're persecuting him for it. Oh, they're torturing Torturing, right? I mean, he's almost gone, right, according right, to right. some it's people terrible. on the inside. Wow, it's so terrible. Jim, you want to say something? I, 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 good, um, well, I'll, if that's related to what we're talking about, I kind of wanted to ask another question that might derail the discussion. Well, I, um, I think I'd still be in the flow, though. Go ahead. Okay, I just wanted to ask about the um, what Locke would say about the uh, the agents of transparency, about how this information, like. Um, Anonymous, for example, about the illegal acts that are used against the government to, you know, shed light because they really facilitated WikiLeaks. A lot of the information mm -hmm. uh, came from, you know, this group of about thirty-one thousand hackers. And every <laughs> when they cut the funding for WikiLeaks by getting Mastercard and Visa mm -hmm. yeah. to stop using them, you know, okay, shutting yeah. down the functioning of credit cards <coughs> worldwide for days, and things that also affect people who aren't necessarily directly involved. Well. The first part of your question, um, the Ill illegality, again, Locke does not use the phrase whistleblower. And his attitude about the problem of prerogative is that there is no solution to it. Right. Right. That's why he uses the language, we have to appeal to God. Because he, he uses that language because he's saying there's no man to appeal to. Who, I mean, let's just run through that logically for a moment. First of all, um, who's in the position to see the problem? Typically, those are the people in the government. And look, if you know, it's, we're, we're facing a different, a similar problem with abuses of our camp, right? If someone knows that we have a zero policy against drugs, right, and they want to do drugs, are they going to do it so that it's out in the open and easy to see? No, they're going to do it secretly. In the same sense, if someone knows that government power is only supposed to be used for the benefit of the people, if they're using government power for their private benefit, are they going to announce it to everybody? No. Usually we find out about these things ex post facto, after it's a done deal. Like, for example, um, NAFTA. NAFTA is, and, and much of our legislation that we face these days tend to be incredibly complicated. And they get crafted by lawyers. And the legislators who are actually signing it typically don't even understand it. Right. Not to mention, don't read it. Right. Right. They, have it they literally have it explained to them to by members of their staff, yeah. and they are deferring to members of their staff. And Locke appreciated this, that government, he used to call government officials magistrates. And he understood that there's a logic within the interaction of magistrates. Even though the social contract theory imagines a time when government began, the actual theory was an attempt to justify government practice that was existing. Okay, So they posited a make-believe time when government began. But all they were trying to actually do is answer this particular question. What makes the action of government legitimate? And Locke's answer was, it's not that God ordained it, it was that the people consent to it. Okay? And so Locke's, in, in answer to the problem, well, Locke, and this objection was treated in his um, chapter 8 um, uh, of the beginnings of government. And so the objection is posed to him. So were there times in history when there was a social contract? And that's a real objection because there aren't. 
No. There are not times in history when people who are free come together and say, let's form a nation. That, that's what makes uh, the Declaration of Independence so extraordinary, yes. okay? And even then, it wasn't a pure act of people coming together. They were colonies, yes. right. so they were adjuncts of another government, okay? So, so Locke had the problem of there aren't historical precedents to what he was talking about. And then there was the other objection. The second objection is you don't have the right to start a government because you are obligated to an existing government. So let's say, here we are in Occupy Buffalo. Let's say we want to make the occupation a government. If we try and do that legally, we could be thrown in jail for treason. And that's what Locke, uh, the argument, right? That in order to, to establish a government authority in a government authority is treasonous to the previous government, the authority. government authority. So Locke yeah. argues, one, he says with the objections, one, there are no historical precedents of this, and two, right, that um, you don't have the right to form governments because that's treasonous to the existing government. So what Locke says in answer to the objections are, he goes, well, you're kind of right with the historical precedents. There aren't really examples of free people. But then he throws out a few things that could be. He says, think of Rome, which is why I make fun of this in class. I spent a lot of time with it. The story of Rome founding was two dudes being raised by a wolf. Yeah. Yeah. Romulus and Remus. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's not a fact. That's a story. Okay? I don't know. All right. All right. So, so and then, then, so he throws out, he throws out, uh, he throws out Rome and Venice, both of which are mired in, in story yes. rather than fact. Okay. So then he goes on. He says, well, okay, most of the first governments were not freely chosen; they were monarchies. Yeah. But he says the nature of those monarchies were that the people chose them. Yeah. And that's what makes that's them the legitimate. Got, got that's you. what makes them right. legitimate. The fact that people largely consented because these monarchs tended to be military leaders who the people rallied around in the context of war. So they have a kind of consent. And he's saying, look, we need to make more government like this, where we make explicit the consenting of the people. So he's basically, in practical purposes, he's saying, let's vote. All right. The answer he gave to the other question of treason is he said there are cases of people leaving occupied places and going to unoccupied places, and they are free to do so. That's, that's the general way he, he approached that. So basically, I say that to, to say that, look, Locke was, was, was not, he was, he was talking about government in the abstract, but he was trying to justify government in the concrete. And as far as concrete government goes, I think his understanding is, people aren't going to rat on themselves. Right. So we have no recourse. He didn't have the term whistleblower. Right. We can speculate about what he would think. And yeah, I think he would say it's, it, it, it's, it's of course, to be supported when people um, are, you know, just judging from what he said in the last chapter where he talks about the right we have to revolt. He also gave us an important thing that shows up in the Declaration of Independence. He, in the Declaration of Independence, we get a statement of principles and then uh, a bill of particulars of things that were done wrong. And the very logic of doing that follows Locke. Locke says, you don't revolt against your government because one or two injustices were done. Right. He uses this language. He says, you have to look for a long train of abuses. A long train of abuses shows a will to injustice. And that is the thing that justifies revolt. So when you see your government acting in a way that shows a long train of abuses, then you have a responsibility to, 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 um, to overturn that government. And here's what he says. Here's what he says. He says, we should not be thrown back to the state of nature. We have a duty to reset government on just grounds. But still, so we when we find injustice, we stop it and we reform it and we start justice again. We start the state again on just grounds because uh, there is nothing more violent and destructive than a civil war. So he does yeah. not want to set up people revolting all the time and having wars and and, and, exactly. and mass death. So be slow to revolt, but once you revolt, know that the point is to reestablish justice. That's right. What when he says 